Hi guys, we have a stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, and it is the 50th day, uh, 50 year celebration of Earth Day today here on Collapse Chronicles, uh, ironically enough. And I am Sam Mitchell, and for the next, I don't know, 45, 55 minutes, I have the great and long overdue pleasure, guys, to bring on to the show to kick off year three here at Collapse Chronicles. We are celebrating our second birthday, the day you are listening to this interview, and we are going to finally, finally, we're going to welcome to Collapse Chronicles, John Zerzan. And if you are not familiar with John, uh, you will be shortly. Uh, I'm just going to go here and trust that Wikipedia has any clue who John is. Uh, John Zerzan is an American anarchist and primitivist eco-philosopher and author. His works criticize agricultural civilization as inherently oppressive and advocates drawing upon the ways of life of hunter-gatherers as an inspiration for what a free society should look like. Some subjects of his criticism include domestication, which is going to be mainly what we're talking about today, language, symbiotic thought, and the concept of time. His six major books are Elements of Refusal, Future Primitive and Other Essays, Running on Emptiness, Against Civilization, Twilight of the Machines, and Why Hope? the stand against civilization, and we'll probably wind up with the question, why hope, at the end of this. But John Zerzan, it's been too long to so I have said, come on to the Collapse Chronicles and say hi to the folks. Greetings, Sam. Great to be here. Okay, well, John, obviously, it, it is April 22nd, 2020. Uh, before we dive into this, uh, what might or might not be an intellectual discussion, give us your five-minute state of the planet uh, on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Where do we stand as a civilization and a species? Well, these are strange days, and now I would say that... Uh, we look at civilization and notice that there's only one civilization left. It's a unitary global thing. Uh, there are different cultures, but only one last civilization. And it's in horrible shape. It isn't just the pandemic. It's the cataclysm of the physical environment. It's the, it's the ravaged social fabric, the mass shootings, suicide rates are up, the whole thing, everything about it is pointing to its failure. All the previous civilizations have failed, and this one is failing very visibly, very grandly, and it's time to take a look at it at that level as a civilizational fact. And compared to 50 years ago today, are we uh, on a better track, or are, are we closer to the proverbial cliff than we were 50 years ago today? Well, we're obviously closer. Uh, the pace of it picks up, the uh, decline, uh, you know, Earth Day. That's a cruel joke. It's really been superficial and uh, hasn't had anywhere near the kind of critical uh, take on it that's necessary. It's uh, everything else but what is mass society? What is civilization? Why is it going this way? What drives it? None of these questions uh, have come out of Earth Day. <laughs> you know, the wringing of hands, the concern, it's just a lot of hot air. It's just, it's making things worse because it's a lot of bullshit. There, there you go. That was pretty much my summation of my own Earth Day uh, video about an hour ago. So anyway, John, one thing, one thing I was pointing out on that video uh, you know, I, I, I decided I would get up and see how the mainstream media was uh, promoting 
Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So I go on to Yahoo News, go down every story on the planet. There is no mention of the 50th Earth Day. There is zero mention of it. There, there's barely mention of, as there has been for the past month, the environmental news with the possible of exception of a little bit of climate change news still squeaking through, the environmental, ecological news has been completely obliterated off of the mainstream media, most of the alternative media, and we all know why. And while I, you know, as much as I don't want to do this on one hand, John, we obviously know why that's true. There is one story on the planet today. There is one story, there is one story only on this planet, and it's the same story that's been the only story for a month. And now that we have been immersed in this, where do we even start? Where I want to start is I want you to talk about your definition of domestication, particularly as it applies to the domestication of humanity. And I want you to, using that reference, I want you to help explain to us what is going on on this planet today, John. Well, specifically in terms of the pandemic, I think we get right to the heart of the matter. Everyone admits or concedes that it's a matter of density. It's a function of density. That's why stay at home. I don't know. We, all, right, we, we, we lost you for a few seconds. So uh, repeat whatever you said in the last five seconds. Well, it's the last five seconds only? Yeah. Uh, hmm, where was that? <laughs> well, the the uh, the progress of civilization is one of densification. It's one of urbanization. It's one of these, you know, tower block people living in these cages that are many stories high. This is the exact reason you have plagues and epidemics. It starts with domestication when you're when you start to crowd people together in permanent settlements. Before that, people lived in banned society, hunter-gatherer life, face-to-face -face life, which was usually somewhat mobile. And uh, disease didn't get a purchase. When you have that kind of situation, you're not breeding or incubating these diseases. They don't exist before civilization, before domestication, that is. Well, define your term, uh, domestication, particularly as it refers to the human animal? Well, it's, it's the agricultural revolution. That's what we're talking about. It's the introduction of the control ethos in society over, over other animals and over ourselves. We control, we start with, we start with farming introduces private property, uh, the unnatural population growth, War, everything else, and but the first, the first move is Paul Shepard said, when we look at all these high tech developments, he said they're implicit in the first step, which is the domination of nature. That's what domestication is. Instead of taking freely from nature what nature gives, you start engineering nature. You control it. You fence it off. That's uh, that rather the opposite of. Uh, of pre-domesticated life, and it keeps building upon itself. This, this control thing is always extending, and uh, it's more invasive and extensive, and it just keeps on going, just keeps on going. It'll keep on going forever until it's questioned, until it's uh, stopped. And, and so humans are just the, the, the latest of, of a long list of animals we have uh, domesticated that we have uh, that, that we that we have just become so domesticated that we, we, we've just lost touch with what's real and what's important. Well right and I, I 
I very frequently find myself thinking of uh, Freud's civilization and its discontents, which is, you know, what he's really talking about is domestication uh, and its discontents. And he points out that people are not happily domesticated. He says that's the basis of neurosis. That's the machine for making people unhappy. You can domesticate some animals and they don't resist uh, as much as other ones. And some animals you can't domesticate at all, like say zebras. But when you domesticate humans, when they, when they go through this process and are thereby domesticated themselves, it's not a happy story. It's, it's a wound that doesn't heal. It's, it's really, he got right to the heart of it. It's a very radical essay, one of his later essays. So do you, would, would you consider that this whole coronavirus, uh, uh, I, I, I don't even know if we have a word in the English language to explain What's happened? Okay, so for, for instance, I was interviewing another guest uh, two days ago, uh, and he was pointing out how that what the coronavirus has done is it has actually brought the human community together, that we are a more cohesive community uh, than, than we've ever been, and we should build on this opportunity of this, uh, I guess, this kumbaya moment uh, that we're experiencing to, uh, to, to like, back off on uh, civilization. And then you have, of course, other guests I've interviewed, a 180 degree uh, opposite that what is going on uh, it is the absolute opposite that we are seeing a with these lockdowns a a a rollout of the whatever you want to call it the Orwellian police state surveillance state uh, and and that you know we are seeing more guns and ammo being sold in March of 2020 than any month in history. And this is taking us to Mad Max uh, because the people who refuse to be domesticated uh, are, 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 are not going to put up with this. And, and so you d d just run with this. Are we heading into Mad Max or are we heading, heading into Kumbaya by the evidence you have seen in the last month? Well, it's a mixed bag. These things are contending with each other. And the people that, are, that want to break out of the uh, uh, stay-at-home deal, they're not exactly non-domesticated. They're more these uh, Trump idiots than anything, right? I mean, we're all chafing at the restrictions. But, you know, it's a question of what, what understanding are we seeing? What, what are we getting out of this? What do we make of it? Are we connecting the dots? That's what not, I'm asking I mean, you to do. Well, that's not, I, more, I say, for example, uh, Counterpunch, which is a big flagship progressive yeah, website, yeah. of course, long running. Well, they're now publishing essays that are anti civilization. It's a very uh, pleasant surprise. I mean, these, these uh, progressives, these leftists, have never seen that, and now they're starting to see it. So that's what we need to further. We need to further the dialogue and the understanding about that. These, this, just, all of these horror shows keep getting worse. What is it that causes that? You know, if you don't get to that, you're just spinning around in the dark and getting more fearful and having these uh, random reactions uh, based on no understanding. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely want, want, want to use this as a springboard into the larger conversation. But I, I, I want to get you, since you have written so extensively on how uh, the, the, the way I'm reading it, that civilization and domestication and whatnot has raised the level of anxiety and depression and stress and how communities, uh, you, you know, how it, it, how it dissolves and destroys community and us being able to get together and now we, it, it, it seems to me, without getting into the health and economic effects, I'm simply trying to help you, help us understand 
what what's going on from uh, from the perspective you talk about when we have an entire planet in fear mode uh, what is what is that going to mean over the, the course of the next few weeks to months uh, as this, what is the term, social distancing uh, keeps being enforced. Do you see this as, uh, as a good thing, a bad thing? or? Uh, well, the, the fear and anxiety are nothing new. That's obvious. So it's, it's not terribly helpful just to fixate on this pandemic phenomenon, uh, horrible as it is. I mean, this is this is already there. You see, you read about the bad dreams people have over the collapse of the environment, over the school shootings, children having to drill for the next time the shooter comes in and, and murders a bunch of people. These these the awful things are already here. You could, I mean, I'm not I'm not discounting the pandemic, but you know, take take a look at the larger picture. This is nothing new at all, and the the. The destruction of community, you know, it's been dissolved in mass society. So any, you know, that's that's already here. It's all. How much worse does it have to get? This is just the the latest extreme uh, horrible thing that's happening. But it's nothing new. Okay, one one more question, and then we're then then we're going to get on to the bigger picture, which is really what we're here to talk about at uh, Co- Collapse Chronicles is, is the bigger picture. The, the, the whole concept of social distancing, is, is, is that an oxymoron? Is there anything good to be... Uh, I, I, I'm talking from a psycho-spiritual community level. Is there anything to be gained by social distancing or do you see that as an oxymoron? Well, you're moving against density, which is, uh, again, the, this, this whole thing is a function of density. That's how it uh, uh, grows and spreads. So you've got to counteract the density. So you go in the opposite direction, <laughs> telling people to stay home and stay stay separate from each other physically. But, uh, you know, that's just a... That's just a temporary uh, prophylactic idea, and uh, you know that's uh, people are people are aware of that the social distancing. Though I mean, the irony there is we've been we've had an enforced social distancing for quite a while, and that's because of technology. It promises that it's going to bring us together. Everybody's connected. Well, it's just not true. People are terribly isolated. It's just it's just a fiction. The machines are connected more than the people are. We have less and less and less face-to-face communication, have fewer friends. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a ton of sociological study on this that uh, that's the opposite direction that than technology is claiming. Well, certainly the uh, the the social media bonds are are seeming to me at least to buy. I mean, I, I live alone. I mean, you know, I'm totally alone. Well, I'm with my dog. I, I'm out here, uh, 20 miles outside of Austin, so I'm in a little farmhouse. Uh, I isolated out here, completely separated from my friends. You know, where where going to a birthday party has become committing a subversive act. Uh, as I found out Saturday night, uh, but but all all we have left is social media, and even if even if you try to go to the grocery store now, you know everyone is behind the mask. I, I mean, you can't you can't smile at people anymore, and I'm just wondering. Uh, what what kind of uh, what what is kind of effect is this going to have on the on the group psyche uh, if if it keeps going on like this? Well, I don't think we'll probably be masked up forever. But you know, again, my point is we already got there. You see people at a bar or a restaurant or whatever, each one on their phone. Yeah, yeah. Be several people. They're not. They're not interacting socially. That's, you know, that's that's a crazy form of it. And some people are resisting that. Some people don't do that. 
some places in Europe bar bar phone use when they come in to have a meal. Like, they just don't do that here. You know, it's obvious what the, the pathological nature of that is, the emptiness, the separation. And having to wear a mask is just, yeah, that uh, perhaps it underlines this reality that's arrived so fully already. Uh, oh yeah, the, the 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 symbolism that you can uh, a- everywhere you turn in here the the symbolism of of this. But uh, okay, let's use this as a launch pad to to the bigger discussion that we have here on uh, Collapse Chronicles, where I bring on guests. I've I've now brought on um, well about a hundred and ten people. I guess I've spoken to now. Uh, you know, looking ahead into the future, and now we actually have an example of the kind of things that for the past two years I've been interviewing people about predicting. We, we have one to, as evidence of what this is going to look like. Uh, as more and more of these uh, shocks, be they public health, be they economic, be they uh, psychological, uh, ju- judging by how we have responded to this level of shock, wh- where where is it going? Where is it going from here? Well, it's it's going to just keep getting worse. Insofar as people avoid the fundamental question of where does this come from, what drives this, why does every civilization fail, why is this one big uh, global civilization visibly, obviously failing? But you've got it's about a hundred percent liberals who who never who never get down beneath the surface. The, the, any single issue. Thing and they, you can keep doing that forever until there aren't any, until there's nothing left. I mean, that's just a death trip, in my opinion. You got to have a fundamentally radical critique, and what we also, or what some of us also have, is a goal in mind, and that is the restoration of community, face-to-face community, and that means a radical decentralization. You know, if you're I mean, the left in in all of its forms embraces mass society, embraces progress with a capital P. They have quibbles, they want this and that reform, maybe Bernie or something, but that's just nonsense. That's that's fatal. If you stick with that kind of uh, thin soup, you know, that's just preposterous. But that that's not a that that's not an endorsement of uh, uh, of the other side of the fence either. It, it, uh, I, I m- m- make sure that I am understanding that cor- correctly. That you're not endorsing the, uh, the 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 alternative on the right from that. Yeah, of course not, because that's not an alternative anyway. It's just part <laughs> of the racket, you know, left versus right, and nobody gets anywhere. They continue to. They spend billions of dollars on these big election shell games, and and it, that's what takes, as they say, all the oxygen out of the room. That's the 24-7 coverage. Of course, right now it's the 24-7 coverage of how many people are dying from this strain of the coronavirus, but then it's back to the usual uh, insulting uh, non, non-news, non non non-analysis. So what is so? Tell us about the uh, again. I, I guess we need to uh, just get a quick de- definition of the anarcho-primitivist uh, worldview of this, and how you would suggest we we start turning this around. What's it going to take? One way to put it is, if the future isn't somehow primitive, there won't be a future for life on this planet, okay? And if and if you don't want to go in that direction, well, then it's just uh, uh, <laughs> it's pretty bad news. There's there's your fate right there. So you have to start questioning these things at that level. Is that the kind of world you want, 
or are you satisfied with mass society, which is so de-skilling and alienating and unhealthy in every single respect that you can think of? You know, that's the direction to go in. And it's a course of mammoth project. It's a mammoth challenge. There's nothing easy about it. But what choice is there once you once you grasp that? That that's the only that's the only thing there is. Otherwise, the pathologies increase everywhere on every level, uh, in every sphere, and that's exactly what's happening right now. I read today. You know, you mentioned this is April twenty second. The mass shootings. There was a mass shooting in Lebanon today. Nine dead. There was a there was a mass shooting last weekend in Nova Scotia. Twenty three dead. These mass shootings are not just American. Now it's spreading all over because because this. This is a uh, techno civilization is spreading everywhere. It's the same emptiness. People are adrift. There's no community. It's just everything is. Uh, it's all tied together. All of these horrible aspects are tied together. And so the 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 path out of that is. is he, he, I mean, obviously the the central focus is the way I understand your work. Is that there that that technology from any way you look at it, it, it is bad for humanity and the planet. But it, it, and while on one level it's it's easy for me as I, even though I have grossly eliminated so much of my own connection to it, I'm still. Uh, the, the very thought of giving up, uh, it's mainly my, my car and my computer. Uh, those two, I mean, you're going to have to peel my cold, dead, eco-fascist hands off of my steering wheel. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, it sounds good in theory, and it's, easy to, and it's easy for me to get, to cheer you on. I, I mean, I do intellectually, but I look at myself and say... I'm. Uh, I would probably last about a week uh, if, if this if we bring this whole thing down. Well, that's the challenge. We better get ready. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we we're offered various things, various uh, compensations. For example, right now we're talking on Skype. Yeah, you know? that's that's the way it is. That's the world we have right now, and uh, we try to make use of it, but. Uh, you know that's uh, that ain't the future. If you, <laughs> really, it's it's pretty clear to see. So uh, it just underlines the challenge. You know, how do we move away from that? What what kind of things uh, have we lost in the bargain? Yeah, now we have cars, and a million people die every year in car crashes around the world. Uh, everybody, you know, people are choking on the congestion and the traffic jam. I mean, it's a, it's it's kind of a Shall we say a mixed blessing? I mean, really, obviously, it's um, not exactly uh, something that's made things better. Well, it, I mean, it's uh, it, it's not just that it makes things better. I, I mean, I mean, you know, you you know more about the subject than I do. I mean, we are completely one hundred percent. Uh, dependent on it. I, I have been saying for years, John, see if you agree with me on this. You know, people they always ask me, okay, Sam, what do you, what is the trigger that you're looking for that you know it's all over? And my response is when the internet goes down, when you wake up in the morning, you turn on your computer and there's no internet and you understand that it's not your computer or your local service provider, that the internet is no longer there. I say you have 72 hours to get wherever you want to be on this planet to be with whoever you want to be with for the rest of your life when the internet goes down because that is the trigger that our goose is cooked. Do you think I'm being a little over dramatic, or, or, or are you okay with that? Well, that sounds uh, that sounds pretty valid. Yeah, we're we're made more and more dependent. Our lives have moved online from you know direct experience from from real connections. Uh, yeah, if it went off, 
we might have to walk outside and, and uh, get with our neighbors and try to pull together, you know, who has what, who, who knows how to do what, uh, who wants to share what, if it all just collapses. And it could just collapse. You know, there are a lot of people saying it's all dependent on these satellites and it could be a cascading effect, cascading effect where they all start to fail and it may be pretty damn hard to put the whole thing back up, especially if you have a lot of people who don't want the damn thing to be put back up. <laughs> you know, I saw a piece, this is this really got my eye. A few days ago, I think it was one of the, well, it was one of the newspapers in uh, London, I think the Telegraph perhaps, they had a poll, they polled thousands of people and they asked the question, how many of you would like to go back to normal, back to pre-pandemic uh, everyday life? And you know how many people wanted to do that? 9%, 8 <laughs> said they didn't want to go back to normal. I was just amazed by that. And that's because there was a greater sense of community of, of a sense of pulling together, mutual aid, wildlife was back, you could breathe the air again, you know, so you want to go back to normal? That ain't, I mean, less than one out of 10 wanted to go back to that. You think, well, that's the peak of modernity, that's the wonderful uh, deal we've got, we, we've got so many great things. And actually thinking of London, I remember all the stories last year, and it's probably still the same this year, the air in London is worse than the air in Beijing. <laughs> which you can breathe. So even on, you know, prosaic level like that, it's awful. Well, how but, would that 91% yeah, do that? I mean, how how are we going to resist the this, this, the automatic temptation to, quote, just pick right up once once this one blows over and in this little in this little bitty space that maybe we're going to get between this one and, and the next bigger one you know coming down the road and then the next bigger one than that one what what's going to keep us from just uh, you know a lot of people are, are, are laughing off the notion that we're going to learn any lessons and that the rebound effect where it's to just uh, we're all just from our pent up demand and, and boredom, uh, there's just going to be an explosion of going back to normal. I, you know, but when yeah. I read polls like that, it's easy to intellectualize on one hand, but when the rubber meets the road, I don't know if that 91% of people understand what is being asked of them. Well, yeah, and what is being asked of, of the planet? You know, uh, it's the progressive systematic ruin of the natural world that gives us all this great normalcy, right? Exactly. It starts to shred and fray. Then uh, at least some people uh, connect the dots. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that those 81 percent or 90, yeah, uh, 9 percent, uh, you know, in favor of going back. Yeah, they haven't experienced it. They maybe haven't thought it through. That's just it's just a poll. I'm not saying yeah. uh, it doesn't necessarily prove anything really, but but yeah, it, it's a, it's a choice. It's a cost benefit thing. You know, it's a what kind of a life do you want to get? Is it going to just keep getting worse? And actually, the one of the fallback things is well, yeah, but people only live to the age of 20, 30 back in the Paleolithic, which is not true, by the way, and and. Uh, but, but now even that, longevity is starting to shrink. It's, it's no longer true that we live longer and longer. It's also true that we live longer in some ways due, due to, uh, you know, chronic illnesses besetting so many people. They live, they live longer. They live fairly long, but it's a somewhat miserable life. You know, more than half, more than half of Americans have one or more chronic uh, disease condition, more than half. Yeah. So already it's, it's, it's not exactly succeeding at uh, making a happy, healthy life for people, is it? No. So, uh, again, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to, to find the blueprint the, the, the blueprint for the, for the path out of this mess. Uh, 
Well, there's no blueprint. I'm an anarchist, and I'm I'm not in the business of passing out blueprints. That would not <laughs> well, be way to go. Well, no, really. I mean, uh, well, I know, I know all that. I mean, that's kind of the <laughs> irony I was pointing out, John. That uh, uh, that we're that, uh, that that since there is no blueprint, the, I mean, how would you create a blueprint for that? Uh, it, it's just going to be a matter of us figuring it out by the seat of our pants. Uh, well, I guess so. With with certain values and goals in mind, you know, that's uh, otherwise you're just shooting in the dark. I mean, that's uh, I guess you know, in a certain way, you could call that a blueprint, I suppose. But but you no, know, it's it's a uh, it's more of an open thing. I think it has to be because it has to involve people in dialogue. You know, it has to if people you know when when people want to examine this. And, and try to draw conclusions, try to draw some understanding from these experiences, well, that's, that's a process of uh, give and take and, uh, you know, bringing up all these different questions and challenges. So what is our biggest challenge right now? Civilization. There you go, in a word. That's uh, why, and <laughs> the reason they all collapse, getting back to the name of your show, right? Yeah. Why is that? Why are they fatal? Why are they terminal? You know, if you want to just be along for the ride and just hope for the best and and try to take some drugs to allay your anxiety or your fear, well, that's one way to go, and maybe that's going to be the dominant way. Who knows? I'm not I'm not predicting a victory. I'm I'm hoping for it. I'm I'm uh, trying to contribute to it, but uh, who knows? Who the hell knows how it's going to turn out? Okay, so now, now one, you, you're you, you're generally talking to a friendly crowd down here uh, on this channel, John. Uh, but it's a, but it's a tough crowd, so they uh, I, I can't I'm not allowed to have an interview without bringing up the O word, which would you know the third rail uh, of of most environmental. Uh, organizations and even the sites down here in the doom what we call the doomosphere and that is overpopulation uh, right what is the clearly an anarcho primitivist uh, lifestyle returning to to a global you know turning returning to a planet it cannot be returning to a planet where how many mega cities do we have now of 20 million? You know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah, it, yeah. A lot of people are, are going to have to go. Uh, how does the overpopulation angle uh, fit into the anarcho-primitivist worldview? And what do we do? Well, let me put it, it this way, Sam. Noam Chomsky, for example, calls us genocidists, right? Because there's 7 billion people. So if we have a primitivist program, uh, most of them are going to die. Well, yeah, of course. But what? why are there 7 billion people known? Have you ever thought about that? Domestication started the unnatural rise in population. It drives it right now. I mean, that's you've got to get off that trip. You've got to then, – then you have a way to – or at least you have the sense of a direction. You have – you're trying to arrive at a process whereby that population goes down, not suddenly overnight. Of course, people would starve and die in a, in a week or so. Of course not. Nobody, nobody I know is advocating that. But to start going in the opposite direction instead of taking it as a given, Chomsky just takes all that as a given. Well, if you take it as a given, soon there'll be 10 billion, then there'll be 50 billion, yeah. and the ruin will be even more catastrophic than we can even think of now. It's already arriving. I mean, to me, he's the genocidist. He wants us to just keep going toward going right over the cliff. Let's just stick with all this. We got to have more development because we have more billions of people. You know, we got to have more factories. That's insane. That that really is not. He's he isn't. He's not in touch with reality. Yeah, this assumption that uh, that you see on, on it, it makes no difference if it's right, left, or anything else. Uh, it has nothing to do with it. Just this automatic assumption that this is going to be the way it is. So we need to start. You know what I've been 
commenting for for years that all the solutions to everything is is from the supply side. How are we going to supply? Where it's clear that we're going to have 10, 11 million people. How are we going to supply them with food, water, energy, housing, uh, and, and a decent quality of life? Instead of approaching it from the demand side, uh, like nobody is having the is having the discussion of how to approach all this from the demand side. Right. Right. So how do we shift the discussion over to this side? For the few people who, who are having the discussion from the demand side, how do we bring uh, the, the herd uh, ta- you know, talking the supply side uh, mm-hmm. response to these crises over to, over to our side of the field? Well, I think you know, it's got to have to do with the examination of what, what is it we demand? What is it that fulfills us? What is it that gives us a future? You know, that's, uh, and you start to think about that, I think, rather easily. You know, people who have kids, what are their kids' life going to be like in two, three, four, five years ago? I mean, from now, not not ago. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, does it take that much imagination to raise that sort of question? You want to just keep going in this fatal direction? You know, what are you demanding? You know, there's a very great, uh, if you'll pardon me, the... Uh, there's a wonderful essay by Marshall Sollins called The Original Affluent Society. Mm-hmm. It's very witty. He's, he's talking about a um, paleolithic uh, person versus the modern businessman, and they're competing. And he says, well, the paleolithic guy loses in every single way in terms of productivity and, and output and everything. The poor paleolithic guy just, it just fails at everything, except for one thing. Sollins says, he has what he needs and the modern person never has what he needs he always wants more yeah. who's the affluent one I mean it's, it's a brilliant little piece it's just What's it's the remarkable name of it? I, might, I might read that out, out. that's called economics uh, is where you find that where stone age economics okay I will I will look that up and may, maybe share that m- maybe share that with the folks uh so you said four to five years. I mean, obviously, I, I am always trying to uh, cajole or, or trap my guests and to start making predictions on uh, what, what do you see four to five years now? Uh, you, you are a grandfather. Is that true? That's right. That's right. We think about our grandkids all the time. Uh, how old are your grandchildren? Well, they're now 14 and 18. They're not little anymore, but it's, you know, yeah, they're our grandkids. Uh, uh, okay. Five years from now, when they're 19 and 23, as is, uh, I mean, as crazy as it's gotten just in one month, uh, I mean, do you even, yeah. do you even look ahead five years and try to, and try to imagine? Well, it's scary as hell, isn't it? You know, what part of it is healthy? What, what part of it is going in a good direction? You know, it's, it doesn't take too much to see that. They went through all this uh, when they were smaller. Of, uh, you know, again, the mass shootings, how you have the, each child has its uh, role. You know, you bar the door, you go to the cloakroom and so forth. They, they have these drills all the time for obvious reasons. The only reason uh, they're not having school shootings is right now is that the schools are closed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I'll, I mean, I didn't mean to laugh, but, but you know, macabre humor is the... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. It, it probably has. Uh, there, it probably has uh, uh, avoided some, uh, some mass shootings at schools. Uh, the fact that the schools have been closed, that's the reason we haven't had a mass shooting. I've never, I've never thought of, uh, I've, I've never thought of that benefit of the, uh, <laughs> of the lockdowns. Yeah, weird but true. So, good Lord, how has it been 45 minutes? Unbelievable. Uh, we, we, have about yeah. ten, we have about 10 minutes left here to talk about. We, we've been, this whole discussion has been about uh, us, 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 we, 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 human, human, humans. 
uh, let, let's talk about our fellow earthlings, uh, for, let's, let's give them, let's give our fellow earthlings 10 minutes on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, John, right. uh, you, you, you know, speak for them for a while. Well, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to see these photos. Uh, I do Anarchy Radio every week, and uh, Chris, it's not it's not the medium to show pictures, but I refer to these some of the favorites of the week, like the uh, penguins walking down the streets of Cape Town, yeah, or the coyotes in San Francisco walking down the middle of uh, the financial district. You know, it's wonderful, and that's one of the things that people get to see when the machine stops. Uh, and no, there's no way to separate that from the, you know, thousands and thousands of people dying. But, you know, it gives you a little, a little uh, peek at, you know, that nature can heal. And, you know, life comes back. And all you got to do, <laughs> all is the, is the key word, yeah. right? Is stop the poisoning. You can have the healing, but you got to stop the poisoning. You got to stop the wounding, as, uh, as people have said, you know, otherwise... You don't you don't stop the wounding. More more destruction of non human life. We are animals. There are a lot of other animals around and uh get to see a little bit of that in these uh, these photos. They're wonderful. Just it's sort of eye opening, isn't it, to see these. Well it's creating a a human exclusion zone. It, 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 when when you get humans out of the picture, you know, uh, it's interesting you mentioned stopping the poisoning because do, do you agree with me? I have actually heard maybe two other people in history uh, agree with me on this point that Chernobyl, if, if I have to search this planet for any sign of hope of, uh, the, of our fellow earthlings being able to uh, survive humanity, and what we're going to leave behind for them is, is Chernobyl. That that and that our fellow Earthlings would rather figure out how to live in a nuclear, you know, ground zero nuclear disaster zone than just coexist with humans. Probably good-hearted humans just going about their daily business. Do you agree with me on any level that Chernobyl is one of the more optimistic uh, places to look towards the future? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. It's uh, surprising when you when you consider that. You know, right now, by the way, big fires there, and it's polluting uh, Kiev in Ukraine very badly. And it, you know, it was, it's it's. Uh, I don't think it's now threatening that Chern Chernobyl remains, but. Uh, that's what's going on right now, by the way. The fact that we've got these huge wildfires starting earlier and earlier in the year yeah. and bigger and bigger every year, that's another reality. That, 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 is, one, that is one of many, uh, for sure. So what, what, is your, what is your forecast for Earth Day, uh, what was 1970? <laughs> What's, well, what's this conversation you know, going to sound like, like on Earth Day 100? Well, uh, I don't know. It's a little bit absurd. To me, it's like the climate summits. Everybody's forgotten about them because they've just been a joke. Just, just absurd. You know, these, these preposterous, uh, all this rhetoric. Oh, we've got to deal with this. We, we've got to cut the emission. It's just been a lot of crap. I mean, nobody... That's just a, as big a joke as Earth Day, right? That's just these gestures, these political. Uh, it's just a, it's just a baloney uh, deal, and everybody knows it. And Earth Day, that's a nice gesture, you know. You know, one of the things I think about Earth Day, by the way, yeah. just for a second here, the uh, the view from the other side of the moon, the astronauts taking a picture of the Earth. Yeah, and that was that adorns uh, has adorned a million Earth Day posters and other posters, right? Well, think about that for a minute. You know, the fragile Earth. It's it's a wonderful uh, sort of iconic picture, but think about what what do you need to have in order to get that photograph? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Yeah, massive industrialization. You know, it's it doesn't come 
come down from heaven. It doesn't exist in a back in a vacuum. So even that is you can change the perspective on that and you know and be reminded we can remind ourselves that uh yeah it's lovely to look at but at what cost yeah the earth day uh emblem uh is truly a reminder of uh, of the yeah as you say how much of this earth had to be destroyed to to take that picture uh, and, and, and that's true with, you know, with so many things, so many things, uh, you know, e everything we touch, uh, what was the cost to this planet so we can, whether it's a technology or, e or even a photograph like that, uh, just real quickly, since we're already, uh, at the past 50 minutes, since, since you mentioned these uh, the the climate uh, talks and all that, just real quickly, uh, I, I do want to touch on renewable, the Green New Deal and renewable energy, and just shift the technology from uh, you know from from fossil fuels to uh, all of this other technology. Uh, and problem solved. I just want to get the John Zerzan uh, quick review of your your opinion of renewable, clean, green energy. Well, insofar as that is not a fiction, I mean, I don't know. Personally, the way I look at it is you want more power sources, you want more energy to do things that should never have been done in the first place. You want to keep all this running. Yeah, it would be... Uh, ideally less polluting but th but that's not the fundamental thing why do you want to keep this horror show going yeah. it would still it would it would be of course the idea is you know less pollution but uh that's not the only part of it and uh, who knows if it's true you would have to have a big industrial uh superstructure for one thing for these things to be realistically uh effective right you can have these enormous solar farms out in the desert. You industrialize the desert, but then you've got to get all this power to everybody. I mean, it's, some of it is kind of a, you know, a bill of goods. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, this, this whole myth of free energy, I have often said uh, the, the, the worst thing we could possibly do on this planet is come up with a, quote, free energy unlimited energy source to hand over to humans that would be the that would be the end of the planet uh, a lot quicker than we're getting there with fossil fuels if, if we, an unlimited supply of free energy that that's really what our our fellow earthlings need don't you think oh yeah i think you got it right and i bet uh, you know so many people miss that don't they uh, the, 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 don't, don't get me going on the, on the little lefty greenies, as I call them. Uh, anyway, John, it, it, as I say, I, I, my, my, I notice my camera battery is, uh, is sitting here flashing, and we obviously need to pick up uh, the, this conversation again uh, a lot sooner than two years from now. But uh, right now, things are... Are, are winding down. So as I do with with all of my guests here on Collapse Chronicles, if if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell and you did not have free reign to uh, to talk for sixty minutes, but you had sixty seconds to send out the John Zerzan message to planet Earth on the fiftieth anniversary of Earth Day, what would your mainstream media Earth Day sound bite sound like today? Oh, let's see. Uh, the Unabomber was right. We have to dismantle all this. We have to get back to face to face community. That's really the only kind of community there is. The other kind is just an ersatz uh, uh, false version of community. Mass society, mass culture, mass consumption, that entire trajectory is turning out to be a disaster, which is easier to see all the time, I think. And anyway, Sam, I appreciate the conversation. I hope we can have some more.
Yeah, oh. and, I did, oh, and, I, and I do want to make sure that, that uh, d d just for the record, because you know, sometimes the irony doesn't get, get across very well on, on tape, John. When you said the Unabomber was right, you meant in his manifesto, not in, his, not, not in some of his methods. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, just, just, just want to make, but make sure that was not misinterpreted. So, uh, folks, you can find a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more of this over on just johnzerzan.net is just straight ahead. And there's a whole lot of other excellent YouTube uh, interviews with John, and he has a regular show in Eugene, Oregon every week, and good lord how many books on amazon.com so we could go on with this conversation but ever forever so john stick around for just a minute after i i hang up here but right now guys uh, we need to wrap up this is sam mitchell if you appreciate uh what john had to share with us today please spend a few seconds thumbing up uh this video and if you would like to subscribe to Collapse Chronicles, we would appreciate it. And John, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your schedule here on Earth Day to visit with us. And more importantly, we appreciate your lonely work over the last 40 years and keep up the good fight. Thanks. You too, Sam. Bye, guys.